Hello everyone. Brutal Soviet devices have always attracted my attention. And in general, I love studying retro technology for hours, as most of it is assembled by hand. And when you touch a device made half a century ago, you realize that someone spent more than a few hours assembling it. That's where the warmth of old devices comes from. They have a soul embedded in them. Today we will look at a very rare device, almost without any identifying marks. I also couldn't find any information online. To get ahead of myself, I'll say that it belongs to a friend of mine and is currently not working. That's actually why I have it. The device is actually very interesting. Initially, I thought it was made in the late 80s or early 90s. The exact production date was determined after opening it up. With 90% certainty, we can say it's a marvel. Made at the Abovian Bismarital plant in the Armenian SSR. The logo indicates this. Judging by the fact that all the inscriptions are in English, it's possible this device was made exclusively for export. Another point. This thing was assembled, as it turned out later, after the collapse of the Union. And they made it from what was available. You'll understand a bit later why I think so. Oh yes, I forgot to say what it is. Please, welcome. A 12 to 220 volt converter plus an automatic charger with a current up to 10 amps. I think that even during the Soviet era, devices of this type were in demand, but they were extremely rare. It's something like a modern uninterruptible power supply. More precisely, with a little modification, it could be turned into an uninterruptible power supply. Let's start with the main characteristics. It is powered by a 220 volt network when functioning as a charger. There is a charge current switch on the front panel. You can choose either 10 or 6 amps. When functioning as a step-up converter, the corresponding wires are connected to a car battery. And at the connectors located at the front, a voltage of 220 volts is generated. By the way, the converter here is a genuine 250 watts. That's not bad even by today's standards. The casing and appearance. The chassis is universal. A lot of devices were made on this base. A reliable, time-tested design. Made entirely of duralumin and aluminum parts. The casing has numerous ventilation holes. There is no active cooling here. And it's not needed. At the back, there's a socket for a fuse. From here, the power cord and the power wires leading to the battery come out. A friend mentioned that this device has been repaired and modified multiple times. A powerful PPN 45 type switch is installed on the side. It disconnects the battery from the device. According to the owner, this was done for quick turning on and off of the converter. In general, there is a low power button on the front panel of the device for these purposes. But apparently, something burned out and the system didn't respond to the button, so they decided to install a toggle switch directly on the power bus. In any case, the person who installed such a toggle switch was by no means a foolish person, as they knew what they were using. Such a toggle switch can easily handle currents of 35 to 40 amps. But I have a hunch as to why the converter isn't working. The electrical tape is wrong. They should have used blue. Oh yes. I'm sure many will write, this toggle switch is radioactive, it has a luminous material made from radium-226, that's why the tip of the toggle glows in the dark. All the most interesting features are on the front panel. First, we have something resembling a plug. In general, it's a 220 volt output. Two parallel sockets, allowing you to connect two loads at once. Next, I dare say, are the charger settings. A button for selecting the charging current and LED indicators. Next to it are the converter settings. On, off, and another button. Most likely, some kind of manual mode. For example, quick, shut down, or something like that. And the network. A switch with an indicator. We're done with the external overview. Now let's see what's inside. And inside, everything is ingenious and simple. A huge iron transformer consisting of four U-shaped cores. In terms of size and power, it is comparable to two TS-180 type transformers. So, it's quite a robust transformer. The power is about 350 socialist watts. 
but it can easily deliver. N kilowatts. The windings are copper. In the secondary circuit, the wire diameter is mm. Overall, the device consists of four units, a transformer, a control board, power transistors, and a capacitor block. The control board contains the driving part of the voltage converter based on the popular CMOS dual D-flip-flop chip K561TM2. The output signal from the chip goes through a driver on low power switches to the bases of the power transistors. There are four power transistors here, with each pair of switches connected in parallel. These are KT827 transistors. In my opinion, the best transistors ever made in the union. Each of these transistors is rated at 125 watts. Two switches in parallel provide exactly 250 watts. So the inverter's power is not overstated. The transistors sit comfortably on their heat sinks, which in turn are attached to the chassis. But they are completely isolated from it with mica insulators and plastic bushings. There should be no problems with cooling. By the way, the converter circuit looks something like this. In fact, it's a very popular circuit that I've personally assembled multiple times. The topology of the circuit is push-pull. Each pair of switches works on its own winding. The output signal from such a converter is rectangular. I didn't find any additional protection units besides the fuse. However, the charger circuit is much more interesting. The charging current can be either 6 or 10 amps. Moreover, the charging is automatic and the device turns off if the battery is fully charged. How is this implemented? All attention to the circuit. The charger has only two low-power transistors. This is, in theory, a stabilizer that monitors the voltage on the battery. If it reaches the required value, the relay is triggered and the charging stops. The required voltage for triggering can be set with a trimmer resistor located on the board. How is the charge current limitation organized here? In a very simple and reliable way. Ballast capacitors are connected in series with the transformer's primary winding. The greater the capacitance of the capacitor, the higher the current. Limitation. The charge current selection button simply connects additional capacitors in parallel, thereby increasing the capacitance and charge current. Current stabilization and other headaches here are not needed. The battery charges with a current of no more than 6 or 10 amps, and when it is charged, the device turns off. Such a system is very reliable and simple. No smart controllers are needed, just two transistors and a couple of relays. In this case, REN34. The fact that these relays were made in 1993 suggests that the device was made after the collapse. Although the relays were replaced, as evidenced by the abundant amount of rosin on the trace side. But during a careful examination, a date was found on the board. The fifth month, 1993. That is, a post-Soviet assembly using Soviet components. I can't say for sure, perhaps such converters were also produced during the Soviet era. The rectifier here has a center tap, only two diodes KD213 with a current of 10 amperes. They are pressed against the case and are well cooled. An interesting point. Another KD213 diode is soldered to the input. Apparently, the power of the craftsman soldering iron was small, so the soldering isn't great, but that's not the point. Most likely, they wanted to implement protection against reverse polarity or power reversal, which looks like this. But the thing is, in this circuit there should be a fuse, and if the battery is connected incorrectly, the diode will open, blowing the fuse, thus protecting the circuit. But in our case, the diode is directly soldered to the input, and it will simply burst. If the battery is connected incorrectly, it certainly won't protect the circuit. Overall, what are the impressions? The design is not bad, but it's not the safest. Many high voltage parts are not insulated at all. No complaints about the casing. It could withstand a nuclear explosion. They didn't skimp on metal back then. As I mentioned earlier, the device came to me in a non-working state and was burned out. There's a lot going on here. 
First, I'll repair it. If the work doesn't satisfy me, I'll completely replace the internals. I'll only keep the power units, transformer, and transistors if they are, of course, functional. On that note, I think it's time to wrap up. Rate this video, it's time to say goodbye. As always, this was Kazian K with you, and until next time, goodbye.